But again, the explosion, the main one there at the Marathon Sports, and then you can hear after that, Paula, it's just absolutely heartbreaking to see this. this it's been a year since the bomb attack at the Boston Marathon. InfoWars was pointing out the inconsistencies in the story from the very beginning. Was there any play in knowledge, Joe? Because according to BostonGlobe.com, they said they were doing drills this morning for the same exact thing that happened, according to BostonGlobe.com. Now, was you guys given any warning ahead of time of this uh, uh, taking place? As I said earlier, there was no specific intelligence. Oh, sir, why were loudspeakers telling people in the audience to be calm moments before the bomb went off? Is this another false flag stage attack to take our civil liberties and put more homeland security uh, sticking their hands down on the pants on the streets? No. And it wasn't just the Boston Globe who reported the drills. There was dogs uh, with their handlers going around sniffing um, for explosives, and, and we were told on a um, loud announcement that we shouldn't be concerned if this was just a drill. So may, may, maybe it was just a drill, um, but I've just never seen a, a, a drill like that. The most show of force that a track coach has seen in a lifetime of marathons. This brings up questions of prior knowledge. And on the subject of prior knowledge, we found out that the CIA, FBI, and DHS knew of Tamlin Zarnaev before the bombing. Reports show that the older Zarnaev had previously attended a workshop sponsored by the CIA. The word is also out that the FBI and Department of Homeland Security had been tipped to Tamlin's visit to a radical mosque in Dagestan, a neighbor of Chechnya. The FBI felt that this was of little consequence and didn't consider him a threat. Also, the suspect's uncle Ruslan, who quickly distanced himself from his nephews, worked for USAID. As the article points out, the U.S. Agency for International Development is an agency used by the U.S. government to operate humanitarian NGOs instrumental in running color revolutions in former Soviet states. And he just so happened to be the relative of choice for state-run media. I understand that there must be several criminals and other people on U.S. databanks, especially with the DHS putting toddlers on the no-fly list. But if you have a suspect who the Russian government warned you about, attended CIA-backed workshops that the DHS was briefed on and the FBI interviewed, why does the FBI need public assistance identifying the suspect? Not to mention how the feds reportedly called the Zarnayev brothers after the bombing and before any other incidents. Somebody out there knows these individuals as friends, neighbors, co-workers, or family members of the suspects. Though it may be difficult, the nation is counting on those with information to come forward and provide it to us. Did you ask any of your co-workers their agents? Aside from Stonewall and InfoWars reporter Dan Badandi, goons got in his face for dare asking real questions. Are both suspects seen planting these devices at the finish line of the Boston Marathon? No. The only one who was observed planting what we believe to be the device is suspect number two with a white cap. Let's talk about those photos. It was bomb drills Monday morning. We got photographs on InfoWars.com, folks. Uh, Next question, please. Jahar's white or gray backpack with the black stripes is clearly not the black backpack with the white or gray stripes that exploded. In fact, the bags are the exact opposite. The only official photos that should be officially relied upon in this investigation are those you see before you today. So what's the possible explanation for these bizarro backpacks? And you're carrying a you backpack. We have one here. This is a white color nylon backpack. Like, like, like number two hat. Yeah. And then it's easy enough for you to go ahead and take out... Uh, the actual device that may hook house the weapon. There's one theory. Doubt of the official story could easily have been squashed by releasing footage of the bomb being placed. Footage that even Governor Deval Patrick hasn't seen. Well, the, the videotape uh, is not something I've seen. It's been described to me. Uh, but it does uh, seem to, uh, to be pretty clear that, um, that uh, uh, this suspect took the backpack uh, off. Put it down. Welcome back. Now, earlier in the program, we talked about how there was a conference this last weekend, 50 plus legislators from over nine Western states meeting to talk about the overreach, the arrogance, and the dangerous confrontational attitude of the federal government. Now, we also had some local officials that turned up in Nevada at the Bundy Ranch situation. They were very concerned seeing the same problems happening there. 
are going to be happening in their area. As one of them, Darren Bushman of Paiute County, Utah, said, it's the same thing in, that we saw in 1993 here in Nevada at the Bundy Ranch is now happening in his county. That's where they believe they are. So they want to see what they can do to try to head this off. Here's what he had to say. This is, this is not just the Bundy's problem. This is a, a problem of Western America. This, this affects every rancher. In fact, this is a problem for all of America. And we're talking about rights here. We're talking about a situation here where they're killing gnats with a sledgehammer. And it's absolutely disgusting what's being done with the taxpayers' money. And, you know, in my county, we, we are a heavy ranching county as well. And my entire county is supporting this effort. And the reason is we're the next Clive and Bundy, yes. okay? We have the sage grouse, we have the goshawk, we have all of these issues, and we have you know daily discussions about new ESAs that are coming along. Um, we have daily discussions about EISs and how we have to protect this and protect that and cut ranchers out of here and cut ranchers out of there. And the interesting thing is America's in love with the cowboy, but we want to put them all out of business. Yeah, It's absolutely disgusting. They bought and paid for these rights as we do water rights, exactly. mineral rights, property rights, okay? All of these rights were bought and paid for. They traded gold pieces, they traded horses, they traded labor, whatever it was, they, they, they managed to buy and pay, the, pay for these grazing rights. Then along comes the Taylor Grazing Act, the establishment of the Department of the Interior, the BLM, all that. They're no longer rights, they're permits that you have to rent the feed from the federal government. Mm -hmm. That was all done without compensation to the American rancher, okay? If now that's very interesting. You said they changed the rights to permits, essentially, which is what they do with our individual rights. They change them from fundamental rights to government-granted privileges. Permission, yeah. yeah We're going exactly. to give you permission, which is revocable. Well, these are not revocable. These are rights, just like property rights. And, you know, if you'll put the word property or water in exchange for grazing when we're having this conversation, the whole world turns upside down, right? Because it's a whole different discussion when we're talking about the Bureau of Land Management coming in and stealing your water, you know, or stealing your property. Well, you know, it's really interesting because if you look at these lands in the West, um, if you look at the state enabling acts for all of these states in the West, there, this land was never intended to be held by the federal government. It was intended to be disposed of um, to the general public, and any remaining lands was to be disposed of to the state. It was never intended that we would um, hold these lands by the federal government. The interesting thing about it is the people who are making the decisions about these federal lands, they don't ever show up on the ballots in these states. So you've got um, decision makers that are not in the state of Nevada, not in the state of Arizona, not in the state of Utah. They're in Washington, D.C. They're, they're senators and bureaucrats from all over the nation who are making decisions about what's happening right here in the state of Utah, what's happening in the state of Nevada, what's happening in the state of Arizona, and they never show up on the ballot in these states. You got Dick Durbin trying to take away 30% of the state of Utah, and he doesn't even show up on the ballot. We don't even have an opportunity to voice our opinion about whether he should be representing us. It's not just taxation without representation, it's regulation without representation, isn't it? It's absolutely regulation without representation. And, you know, the people that are managing these lands should show up on the ballots every two, four, or six years so we can voice our opinion about how they're doing it. Let, let's lock us all up and put us in boxes where we can manage the people, control the people, tell them what they can think, tell them what they can do, tell them where they can be, tell them how they can act. And unfortunately, that's that's where we're at. And you know, I have people ask me, how can you as an elected official support someone who's clearly breaking the law? I guess I would ask the same question of, how did people manage to support Martin Luther King? As he was sitting in Birmingham, Alabama, in a jail cell, that question was asked of him. And he said, look, there are two kinds of laws. There are just laws and unjust laws. And we have an obligation as human beings in the United States of America to obey just laws. We have the same obligation to disobey unjust laws. Now, Darren Bushman wasn't the only local government official there. We also had Dave Miller from Iron County, Utah. Now, he's the guy who pointed out that the Bureau of Land Management was violating its own rules on the use of the land as far as wild horses were concerned in his area. 
They were allowing seven times the number of wild horses on the land that they had said were sustainable, and they were doing nothing about it. Massive hypocrisy, massive overreach, confrontational, dangerous use of force. As he pointed out, it's about much more than some of the legal details. It's about broad issues of liberty and what kind of country we're going to live in. We have a real opportunity for change here. What happened there was a peaceful confrontation of violent, over-the-top government actions. But now we're at a phase where we need to push on the info war. This is a period of time where they're trying to vilify and demonize Clive and Bundy, the supporters, the militia movement, the conservatives, you name it. This is a time we really need to push back. It's a very dangerous time for everyone involved. We hope you'll stay tuned. We hope you'll support Prison Planet TV. If you buy a subscription, that helps to support our operation, as well as passing that information on to your friends, to your family. You can share it with up to 10 people simultaneously at the same time. Well, stay tuned. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Tune in to PrisonPlanet.tv for an extended broadcast.